morning, Dr. Rangarajan, and thank you for this opportunity in which you will share your valued opinion and comments on the completion of 25 years since the launch of the economic liberalization policy in India in 1991. Looking back on the 25 years of India's progress, what is your verdict about the 1991-92 economic liberalization policy which has changed the face of Indian economy? In your opinion, is it a success story? In mid-1991, uh, the Indian economy faced an acute economic crisis triggered by a severe uh, balance of payments problem. The response to the crisis was to put in place a set of policies aimed at stabilization and structural reforms. The stabilization policies were aimed at correcting the weaknesses and the excesses that have developed on the balance of payment front and on the fiscal front. The structural reforms were aimed at removing the rigidities that have entered into the economic system and to make the system more competitive and efficient. This was sought to be achieved by injecting a greater element of uh, competition. The barriers to entry and growth were removed. Perhaps it is interesting to note that the reforms initiated in 1991 have been continued by successive governments, even though there have been several governments since 1991. That means there is a broad acceptance of the principle of liberalization across political parties. How far have we come since we launched the reforms? I think we have come a long way. The record, as far as growth is concerned, is very clear. The rate of growth of the Indian economy has increased, um, has shown an increase over what it was prior to reforms. Uh, between 2005-06 and 2007-08, uh, the average annual rate of the growth of the Indian economy was in excess of 9%. This, was, this happened for three consecutive years in a row. And even if you take another three years, uh, in, in succession, the overall rate of growth over that period of six years from 2005-06 is 8.8 percent. Therefore, there has been an impressive growth as far as the Indian economy is concerned. Uh, we, the recent decline or slowdown in growth is a source of concern. One has to examine uh, deeply the factors that might have contributed, perhaps the factors uh, that might have contributed to the decline. Uh, maybe both economic as well as non-economic. Uh, we need to address it. But in any program aimed at accelerating growth, reforms are important. So if one were to answer the question whether the reforms have been a success story, I think it is mostly a success story. There are obviously some uh, failures, some drawbacks. But by and large, I think uh, the Indian uh, economy uh, is more resilient today, is more competitive today, and, perhaps, and also more efficient. Thank you, Dr. Rangarajan. Going to the next question. On one hand, we do applaud the economic progress that has happened on a large scale with technological advancement and youngsters gaining through greater employment and educational opportunities. On the other hand, there is criticism. Some media reports suggest failures which include failure to increase the share of manufacturing in the GDP percentage, as well as failure in restricting government expenditure over the years, besides lack of quality employment opportunities. What is your assessment and comments about these observations? One of the elements in the reform process was fiscal consolidation. Um, to bring down the fiscal deficit, uh, was uh, one of the uh, earliest objectives of the reform uh, process. And all efforts had been made to bring it down. And finally, uh, this resulted in the enactment of the uh, FRBM, Fiscal Responsibility and Management Act, which sort of mandated that 
the uh, fiscal deficit of the government of India uh, should not uh, exceed 3% of the GDP and the revenue deficit should be brought down to zero. And uh, after the 12th Finance Commission, all the state governments also passed similar legislatures and uh, the fiscal deficit of each state was more or less fixed by legislation in their uh, legislatures uh, to about 3% of the state domestic product. Therefore, one of the objectives of the reform itself is fiscal consolidation and bringing down the fiscal deficit. Well, our experience has been mixed on this. Um, by 2007, we had almost brought down the fiscal deficit of the central government uh, to 3% of the GDP. But then came uh, the uh, uh, international crisis of 2008, and the fiscal deficit almost shot up uh, to 6% of the GDP. Um, therefore, uh, in that sense of the term, there has been, uh, the, the, uh, in that sense of the term, uh, we have not been able to achieve uh, one of the goals set in the reform uh, process. But at least we are conscious of it, the government recognizes it, and even when the fiscal deficit exceeds, uh, always a new roadmap is announced in order to bring down the fiscal deficit uh, to the desired uh, level. So there is uh, uh, this aspect needs to be constantly kept in view so that uh, ultimately we do uh, get to the goal that we have set. Oh, um, uh, you see, the composition of uh, GDP uh, is not solely determined by uh, anybody or, or even uh, the government. Uh, what has really happened is the manufacturing output has increased over time. But when, when one talks about the share of manufacturing in the total GDP, one is really measuring it in terms of how the rest of the GDP has grown. What has actually happened is the services sector has grown at a much faster rate so that what happens is that manufacturing as a share of the GDP uh, comes down. There is a distinct advantage in manufacturing uh, growing uh, because it does provide employment at various levels. With, uh, people for, it provides employment with people with various types of uh, skills. Unlike service sector, which very often focuses on very uh, extremely sophisticated skills. Uh, for example, IT growth um, results in uh, recruiting people with extraordinary skills in, uh, in relation to a particular type of technology. Therefore, it is happening, but what we should really look at is not so much the share of manufacturing in GDP as much as at what rate manufacturing itself is growing. Another area of concern that is reported is that despite claims of success of the economic liberalization policy, successive governments have not shifted towards efficiency in some of the critical areas. For example, they suggest that regulators should replace ministries, thus shifting away from the Sarkar Raj or government control. But today, they coexist, creating confusion. Is this true, and in your opinion, can India afford to move towards a totally free economy? Are there any risks in implementing this kind of a migration? The state or government can play three roles. One, as a provider of marketable goods and services, a regulator. Three, as a provider of public goods and services. As a consequence of the reforms, the role of the state as a provider of marketable goods and services is coming down. Correspondingly, its role as a regulator and as a provider of public goods and services increases. How does the state play the role of a regulator? Is it the responsibility of the direct administrative machinery, which means the ministry? Or do you set up regulators who are independent of the ministry? There is a role both for the ministry as well as the regulator. The, the, the regulation 
has to be done according to certain criteria set down. And therefore, we need the regulator. But we don't need the regulator everywhere. We, we need regulators only in those sectors of the economy where some public um, goal is to be achieved or where competition does not provide. Where competition provides, then the markets will take care. And all that has to be done is to ensure that competition provides in those systems. And that is why you need a broad regulatory authority like the Competition Commission. The role of the Competition Commission is to really ensure that competitive forces operate in all segments of the society and that there is no cartelization. That is the responsibility. Therefore, it does not go into uh, uh, spelling out what each sector of the economy should do. All that it does is to ensure that the competitive forces are not stifled in the, in the system. But there are other areas like the banking system or the capital market where a regulator is needed because the risk associated with a failure of a financial institution is very uh, widespread. It affects not only the owners of those institutions, but also a wider public, and therefore regulators are a need. We need regulators. We need to uh, find out which areas need, uh, which need regulators. Uh, and also, there are broader issues like environment, which also needs regulation. The only thing that we need to take care of is there's a thin line between regulation and controls. We have moved away from the regime of controls and licenses. And regulation should not become a replacement for controls. Regulation must be broadly, uh, must, be in, must be of a different nature from controls. And uh, that is what some people are concerned about. But for the point that, for the question that you raised, there is a role for the ministry. The, the role of a particular ministry, let us say, whether in charge of steel, coal, or whatever it is, is to ensure that uh, the, uh, uh, the adequate supply is available and the availability uh, is uh, appropriately distributed and so on. But at the same time, you need a regulator. And there has to be yeah, a proper relationship between the regulator and the, and the ministry. You were talking about the government providing public goods and services. I would like to go into the social sector. We find that India has not been very successful in improving the social sector, such as reducing its infant mortality rate as compared to some other developing countries. Such observations would suggest failure in the implementation of the policy when we relate it to the benefit of the common man. What is your take on this? The broader goal or objective is not only to let the economy grow fast, but also to ensure that the benefits of growth accrue to all segments of the society. Uh, that is what we call inclusive growth. And this has always been set as the objective of economic uh, uh, policy. It is true that on the social development side, uh, even in the post-reform period, we have not done as well as we have done on the uh, growth side. Uh, the, uh, India still ranks low in the Human Development Index. And in some of the indicators uh, relating to the Millennium Development Goals, uh, we are uh, way, way, way behind. Uh, we need to correct them. But I, what, what is really needed is not to set growth and equity as opposing considerations. In my view, growth and equity go together. When the economy grows fast, it is in a position uh, to be able to meet some of the, some of the socio-economic development goals better. A classic example is South Korea. South Korea, by growing, at the rate of 7 to 8 percent over two to two and a half decades or more, eliminated poverty. Uh, this is what we might call the percolation effect. When the economy is growing at a very slow pace, 
as we did in the first four decades of the independence, when the economy grew at 3.5 percent and the per capita income increased only by about 1.5 or 1.6 percent, the percolation effect is very low. But the percolation effect can be stronger when the growth is uh, uh, much higher. Uh, therefore, growth itself has a certain effect. Uh, as I say, a rising tide lifts all boats, and therefore all segments of the society do get benefit. But then there are drawbacks. Uh, it, uh, uh, even the growth process may favor some sections of the society rather than others. And that is why we need to address the social development issues directly. In some sense, it is a high growth phase which enabled us to launch many poverty reduction schemes such as the employment guarantee scheme or the extended food security, national rural health mission and uh, sub Shiksha Abhyan and so on. Therefore, the resources available to the government also increases in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the growth process. And if there is a definite policy on the part of the government to address these issues, then these resources will be utilized. Therefore, growth automatically does not lead to improvement on the social side. It has to be supplemented by a positive policy action. And therefore, I would suggest the, what we need to do is to follow a two-fold approach of letting the economy grow fast and directly attacking the vulnerable groups, and directly attacking poverty through programs aimed at poverty alleviation. Thank you, sir. One last question. One would infer that what one is looking for is minimum government and maximum governance even in the social schemes that are being introduced. As an ideal condition for a successful economy, what needs to be done further to achieve this ideal scenario for a successful economy? What are your suggestions? One area in which uh, we need to move um, is administrative reforms. Um, basically, when we talk of maximum governance, we essentially mean an effective government or effective governance. And the effective governance means an efficient delivery system. Today, the government, both at the center and the states, have taken on themselves a wide variety of responsibilities, uh, whether it be the provision of subsidies or whether it is uh, providing uh, employment uh, through the employment guarantee scheme or so on. Therefore, the ultimately uh, the impact will be felt of the various programs that are launched only if the delivery system is efficient. I think we need to focus on it. Uh, in the first uh, uh, 25 years of our reform process, our focus has been on uh, other uh, elements uh, rather than on uh, improving the administrative reforms. In fact, the, the reform of the administrative system should also include the reform of the judicial uh, system. Therefore, uh, if, uh, we, uh, even though uh, the idea is not new, uh, we have had uh, several administrative reform commissions in the past to try to look at the way in which uh, the government functions and delivers its uh, services. And many people had also felt at the time when the Seventh Pay Commission was uh, deliberating that any increase in the emoluments of the government employees must be accompanied by greater accountability and greater uh, uh, efficiency or greater show of efficiency on the part of the civil servants. We have not yet been able to evolve a proper system. Therefore, I would say that maximum governance is extremely important, both in terms of not only uh, the, uh, the economy that the government might uh, uh, bring about, but also um, the, for the efficient 
um, delivery of the services promised. Therefore, I think at the cutting edge, it is the delivery of the services, it is the delivery of the various promises that is critically important. For example, the new technology through which uh, we are thinking in terms of uh, transfer of subsidies directly to the uh, to the farmers or to or the or to or the others uh, is a good idea. I think technology has come in handy, and with the uh, combination of Aadhaar, uh, many of these uh, uh, subsidies could be directly transferred to the beneficiaries. Uh, this will uh, mean uh, not only uh, the uh, it will also mean uh, plugging the various uh, loopholes. Therefore, in in my view. Maximum governance uh, is extremely important. Whether minimum government will be achieved or not is a very doubtful issue uh, because uh, the demands on the government are growing. As I said earlier, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the compulsions uh, on the government, uh, the, the compulsions relating to the delivery of many public goods and services will increase because the responsibility for providing primary health, primary education, and uh, other uh, services like sanitation, all of this are not going to decrease. Therefore, they will increase. And the only thing that is required is how will the government deliver these services and uh, whether we have an efficient apparatus for it. Finally, only I will say that even in the delivery of public goods and services, uh, there are various modes po possible. Um, the government can deliver it directly. It can run the schools or it can run the uh, um, uh, primary health centers. It can run the hospitals. Or it can also deliver the public goods through a private public participation mode. Then we might be able to combine the efficiency of the private sector with the larger public goals with the larger goals of public uh, policy. I think we should attempt. Thank you very much, Dr. Rangarajan, for your valuable time and insight.